Welcome to another word in your ear, and we are here to dwell upon one of the saddest stories in popular music, which is the thing that, frankly, Mark and I have talked about from time to time over the years, thinking, what a sad tale that is. And But we never thought that anybody would actually get around to writing a book about it. And I'm delighted <laughs> to say they have. And I'm delighted to say that somebody we've had as a previous guest on the pod, a friend of the pod, Joel Selvin from San Francisco, from the Bay Area. And the book I'm talking about is Drums and Demons, The Tragic Journey of Jim Gordon, whose uh, drumming you will no doubt be familiar with, uh, probably most prominently with uh, Eric Clapton and Derek and the Dominoes. But if you search the sleeve notes of millions of records you've got, some of the most distinguished ones, You'll find his name there on Ricky Don't Lose That Number by uh, Steely Dan. And, Which is uh, alignment. Good vibrations. <laughs> Absolutely. Classical gas. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, as I discovered only this morning, uh, to my delight, New Coat of Paint by Tom Waits from uh, The Heart of Saturday Night. <laughs> and uh, so, Joel, welcome. What made you, apart from the fact that it is the saddest story in popular music, what made you want to write this book? Oh, I've had this story in my mind uh, for many, 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 many years. Uh, as you say, I mean, it's just an incredibly sad story, and so little of it was known. Uh, the, you, you know, the uh, Jim killed his mother, and the, and uh, suddenly he was uh, uh, gone, and and <clears throat> there's no backstory to that at all. It just like happened in a vacuum. Uh, I had met some people 30 years ago who uh, had uh, Jim's cooperation on a book project. And they couldn't finish the book. Uh, they were kind of pro-ams that were looking to write a book for the first time. And, and But they had tons of jailhouse interviews with Jim. They had his medical records. They had, they had everything. And, and they, they, they didn't know what they had. Like I asked this gal about the, the the diaries, and she says, "Oh, they were useless. They just had his studio dates. Oh, only his <laughs> oh. studio dates. <laughs> okay." Uh, but um, I had tried to acquire their research at that time. They uh, were splitting up and moving out of the state, and one of them was fine with the idea, and the other one just couldn't let go of it. And like thirty years later. I'm talking to a book editor who says, you know, Joel, you know, what you got to do is you got to find something that, that combines rock and roll and true crime. And I went, Jim Gordon. Yeah. Circled back with these people and acquired the research. So I, I'm sitting on a pile of uh, 1988 interviews with Jim and a variety of his associates. It was like a, a, a hard nut in the center of my research. I did a, you know, another 100, 150 interviews myself, and there was plenty of detailed research beyond that. But with that kind of a, you know, a, a leg up, uh, I, I, I was I was excited to do this. And and <clears throat> with that, it only took me three and a half years. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know how it is. <laughs> when were you first aware of him, though? Because he wasn't obviously, he was a, he was a session musician when you were a teenager. Mad Dogs I mean, and English. Englishman. Oh, right. Was that the oh, first okay. through, through the film, presumably? Yeah. Actually, actually, you know, I think I, I, I probably was aware of him in Delaney and Bonnie. Right. Yeah. But he, he, came from saw, where, I, he, he came from where? Just tell us how he got to be a well-known drummer. Well, Jim uh, grew up in the San Fernando Valley uh, and uh, discovered drums very early and became something of an astonishing kind of prodigy who was took all the training and all the education and was schooled by UCLA percussion teachers. And the day after he graduated from high school, he went on the road with the Everly Brothers. He was 17 years old. That's kind of starting at the top in 1963. Yes. In September, he was in England, uh, the Everly Brothers were headlining a tour that uh, also included Bo Diddley, Little Richard, and on their first nationwide tour of England, the Rolling Stones. So, I mean, he was right there at the beginning. Back in Los Angeles, 
he gravitated into session work and and you couldn't have been a better time to hit session work in los angeles 1964 65 the whole scene in los angeles exploded behind the beach boys and jan and dean and herb albert and nancy sinatra and sonny and Cher, et etc cetera, etc cetera. uh and he real quickly became the second guy if you couldn't get earl palmer or hal blaine you got jim uh so what was a, it that made ability. him so special what what, what made him so say, he had some kind of ability that was just far beyond anybody else's intuitive uh, levels and my suspicion is that the electrochemical setup in his brain that would eventually create this schizophrenia gifted him with some kind of extraordinary intuition as far as this. I mean, I've had drummers explain to me, oh, the Jim Gordon sound. Yeah, you retard the second beat, and then it gives a <laughs> roll to the whole measure. Yeah. But that's not it. You, you yeah. can't do that, you know, by notation. You can't read that music. You have to feel it. So everything Jim plays on, he brings some kind of luminous touch to that no other drummer would think of or be able. I'll tell you, Jim Keltner told me that when he first met Jim, he had to learn how to play like Jim in order to not play like Jim. So that's how persuasive his style is to other percussionists. There were a couple of things that you mentioned that, that I thought were extraordinary. One was that <clears throat> the pattern left on his snare drum by his sticks was no bigger than a, a quarter, I think. And the other was that <laughs> when recording with Tom Petty, he did an entire track and then they said, we said, why don't we double up the drums? And he had to play the entire part as an exact replica of what he'd done before and did it in one take. I mean, that's supernatural. Mike, Mike Campbell remembers that like a car crash he was in. It, it was like it happened last week. It, it, yeah. it was a miracle before his eyes. It's just like, oh, my God. Uh, and Ben Tench was there, too, the keyboard player in the Heartbreakers. He wasn't on the session, but he was hanging out. And again, he was just like, you just couldn't believe it was happening when you saw it. Okay. Yeah, he had a supernatural ability on the drums. There was nobody like it. And when you think about like the range of uh, records that you were talking yeah. about, I mean, he's got the samba groove on Midnight mm. at the Oasis. He's got the, the boogaloo on Grayson in the Grass. The underpinnings of Layla are just phenomenal. I mean, those guitars so dominate that track. But you can go on the Internet and, and find an isolated drum track. And it's just amazing the subtleties that are wound into that. And I suppose with a, with a session drummer particularly, he has to have the extraordinary ability to hear a song and immediately know what to do. Yeah, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> one of the producers I talked to said that Jim was the only drummer he knew of that would play the first take. You know, everybody else listens and maybe hits the kick drum on the four. But Jim just jumped in and would play things, you know. He had this incredible, like I keep saying, intuition. Uh, and session drummers, you know, they have to play every kind of music. And what everybody found about Jim was that he was not a backbeat timekeeper. He was somebody who played the drums compositionally, and he moved his drum parts into the musical framework of the record. And you can uh, hear that on all kinds of his work. You can. That's what I was thinking this morning when I was listening to New Coat of Paint. You know, it's like you say, he was the most musical of those drummers. And he's, he's entirely musical, his contribution to that thing. You hear things that you would never realize were the drummer. And they are, they're all, all his creations. You tell the story in the book, just jumping ahead. You know, he 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 was in London quite a lot of the time in the in the late sixties, early seventies, and he ended up at Trident Studios when they were making "You're So Vain" with Carly Simon, and uh, they tried this with a number of drummers, hadn't they? And and none of them they, worked out. Go on. Yeah, they, they'd uh, tried it with Carly's drummer Andy Newmark, and they tried it with uh, some British session player, all in the same week. And Jim just happened to be passing through London. Uh, with the Frank Zappa tour, uh, and and producer Richard Perry said, get down to the studio right now. Carly threw a fit. Well, I thought we've already done this. What's the deal? And Andy Newmark uh, was there, 
uh, and and he asked Jim, could he watch the uh, recording session from the drum booth? Jim said, sure. So he pulled up a stool and sat there for five hours while Jim did 60, 70 takes. That's Richard Perry's sort of style. And uh, uh, Andy said, never made a mistake, ne- never just completely went forward, forward, forward. And when they were done, there was a six-inch crater on the yeah. snare drum. Yeah, yeah. It's extraordinary. So just going back, so he he, he works as a session man in, in in Los Angeles, but then he ends up with, did he end up with Delaney and Bonnie's band? That's where he uh, sort of starts out of the, uh, getting out of the session work, although he'd done some dates with Chad and Jeremy at, uh, uh, after leaving the Everly Brothers. But really, he was, his, his whole focus was studios, three sessions a day, six days a week. Um, and then, you know, the Delaney and Bonnie thing was kind of hot. It wasn't a big selling record or anything, no. but it was attracting a lot of attention. And they were the gigs were around Los Angeles, and it was kind of getting glittery, you know, like Dave Mason sitting in one night, Steve Stills the next. And I, I think Jim was, you know, he was hungry for that kind of action. He was tired of being in the rooms with no windows. And it's 1969, man. You know, rock was a, a, a huge thing in the culture at that point. And uh, Delaney and Bonnie's band uh, crossed paths with the Rolling Stones in October in, in Los Angeles. And uh, they tried Bonnie out on Gimme Shelter and they put Bobby Keys on the record. And they remembered uh, Jim from uh, in- England, from the Everly Brothers. From the Everly Brothers. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting that, that, that you kind of see both those worlds, the, 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 the studio based pop factory of the 60s uh, built around singles and the kind of big rock tours promoting albums in the 70s through the window of Jim, don't you? Because he switches from one world, as you were just saying, to the other. Was, was there a reason, did he, was part of it wanting more of a profile? Because when he actually joined rock and roll bands, that and Mad Dogs and Englishmen and stuff, he, he really kind of changed personality slightly, didn't he? It became... I think, I think that he was... I think you're absolutely right. I think he was reaching for some of the the perks of the position. I think he wanted some of the sunshine and the spotlight. Uh, He had achieved everything he could achieve as a studio musician. He'd made a fortune. Uh, He'd played on the biggest hit records in the business. Uh, And the excitement in 1969 about live rock, I mean, that's Led Zeppelin was blowing out uh, uh, concerts, two and a half hours with a you know yeah. half-hour drum solo. Drum solos, and, and, that's right. Cream. Yep, and, and the Who were uh, touring to- Tommy that year. And, of course, then the Stones came back. And, and I mean, th- these, this was a gigantic arena. And, and hit, hit records were, like, getting smaller by comparison. And uh, the FM radio was just about to break open. All this was like a, a, a pivot point. And, yeah, Jim saw it and, and, and jumped on it and ended up in London uh, with uh, uh, Clapton forming Derek and the Dominoes and cutting the tracks to the George Harrison solo album, which was pretty much sort of the, the pinnacle of the rock scene at that moment. Yeah. So tell us the story of his involvement with Layla. Well, uh what you're asking about is is the coda the the, the well uh, just generally uh, i mean no go on tell the story well you know the the songs about clapton's love affair and all that uh and uh it was a uh, unnote noteworthy in rehearsals uh at, at, but when they got to miami and dwayne allman showed up uh he, he changed the tempo of the song and uh uh, uh nicked a lick from a albert king record and boom, yeah. it just was transformed into this amazing piece. But <clears throat> Clapton really was never satisfied with the ending. And they come back to the studio to finish up the album, you know, a little post-production and stuff like that. And he remembers a piano piece that uh, Jim and his then-girlfriend Rita Coolidge uh, had played for Clapton when uh, Clapton uh, was working with Delaney and Bonnie. 
And, and Rita had written uh, lyrics to this uh, and uh, gave Clapton a tape of it. Uh, but now we're back in Miami and he wants to finish Layla and he convinces Jim to drag out this piano uh, piece. And, and Jim cuts a version of it on piano and then they bring Whitlock in who doesn't dig it at all. He doesn't think it fits with the song. He doesn't think Jim's a writer. <coughs> all of the above. But he cuts another version of it and they make a composite and Tom Dowd sticks it on the end of Layla. <coughs> and when they first put the single out, it doesn't have the, the, the piano part. And then turkeys, it stiffs. A year later, they put it out all seven minutes with the piano part, and it's a top ten hit. <laughs> Further, furthermore, Jim Gordon is now 50%, uh, he's a co-writer. But so so there, Rita Coolidge was a huge about it. Rita Coolidge it was cut out of it totally. <laughs> cut out of it totally. She's doing a photo shoot at AM Records for publicity photos, and somebody's got a radio on. And she hears this thing in the corner of her ear, and he goes, wait a minute, that's my song. And she was very upset, and she talked to her record producer, David Anderley, and she talked to Jerry Moss, the head of, uh, of A&M, and nobody really wanted to go to bat with her. She didn't have a copyright. Mm -hmm. uh, and she actually called up Clapton's manager, Robert Stigwood, and he just intimidated the hell out of her. Uh, well, didn't so Stig would say something off. like, well, what chance have you got as a kind of solo girl singer or something, didn't he? I mean, something just really shocking now. Yep, he was aggressive. And, you know, this had happened to her before. She and um, Delta Bonnie Lady. had written, uh, yeah. they had Groo written a song. That, yes. Yeah. yeah, and it was a big a big hit record for Delaney and Bonnie, and it was on uh, uh, the, the Carpenters. Englishman tour, and then the Carpenters had a hit with it. But yeah, the, the, uh, it, it was copyrighted by Leon Russell and Delaney Bramlett, yeah. and they had nothing to do with anything but the copyright. Right, I can't believe. So she'd seen that happen before. I mean, uh, uh, what I say in the book was that the, the music business was just a pirate ship, and she was just a wench. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also the way people behave is so astonishing. The details you've got about Clapton. There's a bit where they're on a train, him and Jim Gordon, and they have an argument, and he just gets up in the carriage and picks up Jim Gordon's case and throws it out of the window you know uh, and uh, routinely they they throw glasses against walls and smash up places that they're staying in with really nice and hospitable hosts who've let them stay there i mean i kind of just think there's absolutely no way people could behave like that now because everyone would find out about it don't you think and you know the south kensington uh, uh townhouse i mean it must have been a beautiful place yeah right across the tube uh, uh, stop, and, and uh, it's probably some you know Russian lives there now. <laughs> uh, but uh, the uh, uh, yeah, the behavior was unbelievable. But also the 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 drug use was off the charts, and the alcohol use was off the charts. They were shooting cocaine and heroin in massive amounts. They were guzzling tequila, which was kind of a new thing in England at that point. Uh, and they just went around blitz the whole time. Uh, that affects your judgment, your communication skills, and everything. And plus, this is about the time where Jim's uh, uh, illness is really beginning to protrude into his brain. And the the mask of the genial, uh, kind, easygoing, smiling California guy, that was the mask that he wore. And that starts to slip during this time, like you say, you know. Uh, and pissing off Clapton until he throws the books out. There's a, a, a Christmas scene at Clapton's place where Clapton's bought Jim a, a, a fancy antique drum, and, and Jim goes, what's this then, you know? <laughs> so they were beginning to, to be unpleasant to each other, uh, which, you know, is partly the characters involved, partly the, the drug and alcohol abuse, and then again, the incredible bubble of being one of the world's greatest rock stars in 1970. I mean, was there a more uh, elevated place in society at that point? I don't think so. No, no, sure. No, that's true. But it's that's particularly true. it's very it's particularly interesting to read this book in the in in, in the current the present time when everybody talks about mental health issues 
you know, to, to cover all kinds of things. Whereas Jim Gordon clearly had appalling mental health issues, undiagnosed at the time. Is that fair to say? They, they didn't even stand out. That's also sort of the uh, extraordinary irony. Uh, in the Mad Dogs and Englishman tour, uh, Jim had an episode where uh, he clobbered his girlfriend, Rita Coolidge, knocked her unconscious in the hallway and, and, and made no bones about it, just went back to the uh, hotel room he'd been in uh, as some kind of a rupture. Uh, but, it, it, you know, it was went by the crowd without any trouble because authentic insanity what couldn't be distinguished from what was going on anyway. Yeah, they would have thought that was just kind of drugs and alcohol having an effect, presumably. And uh, or, you know, was, uh, there was so much outlandish and outrageous uh, behavior going on, that just didn't strike anybody as that uh, as, as severe, that extreme. Yeah. <laughs> they literally couldn't distinguish authentic psychotic uh, behavior. Did he manage to get it under control at any stage of his career? So, yeah, a little bit. He could he could hold it in. And, you know, this is the thing I think about a lot. I mean, first of all, he was vexed by the whole thing. He felt like he was an intelligent person who should be able to think his way out of this situation. And he couldn't. And I think he was ashamed and as a result, he wouldn't discuss this with anybody. He would see psychiatrists, but he wouldn't tell them the full extent of his affliction. He wouldn't tell them that he was hearing voices. Um, so all that was going on for him, and he was struggling to keep this face on so that he could continue to work and continue to function in real life, while inside it's just like roiling, uh, finally starts to sort of come out in the open in 73, 74 with the Souther Hillman Foray band, where Jim's behavior is just just impossible. And, and, and also, for the first time, it's affecting his performance. He's not on time for concerts. He's dragging time. And, and when he does play, it's like, what's this? And they fired him. So the so, time when he's joining Frank Zappa and he's joining, um, you know, uh, Steely Dan and working with them, were they aware of the things that he'd done in terms no, of... No, nobody knew that Jim was sick. No, Nobody no. ever knew that Jim was sick. He, he, he kept that hidden completely. There are very few people he ever admitted it to. And only that that only starts happening like after he's been in mental hospitals. Uh, you know, he, he got into a thing with Dean Parks at a, at a session once. Stop that. I know what you're doing. What? You're making my hands uh, uh, go back and, and, and you're making me miss the beat, uh, first beat on every bar. And, and Dean Parks is playing guitar in the session. He's, he doesn't even know what Jim's talking about. And everybody in the room is going, what is he talking about? Uh, so they, they go ahead um, and, and uh, Johnny Rivers, it was a Johnny Rivers session, says, says, Jim, he can't do that from over there. Now let's just count it off and go. And, okay, you know, one, two. And, <laughs> but Dean had no idea what that was about. It was year years later that Jim says to Dean, you know, I have mental issues and I've actually been committed to mental hospitals about this. And, and that's like, oh, oh, so that explains that. So there were a bunch of like mysterious episodes. At the very end, he was playing with a, a, a kind of blues band called the, the Blue Monkeys. And, uh, None of those guys knew that Jim had any problems. Uh, they were all having dinner one night, and and Jim ordered a steak, and he carves up the steak and and, and takes a bite and holds the the bite in front of his face, and just the fork wavers, and what's going on is inside his head the the voices are commanding him not to eat, and he just throws the fork down and goes, I gotta go tosses a $20 bill on the table and leaves. And the guys left behind, they have no idea what's just happened. They can't uh -huh. figure it out. 
is just totally mysterious. Why would he do that, right? And none of them knew anything about this until Jim was arrested. Mm. So all that stuff about the voices in his head you got from the medical records, presumably. There's a lot of, uh, of Jim talking about it. Uh, there's a lot of lawyers talking about it. Uh, the, 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 yeah, I, you know, I, I spoke to one of his psychiatrists at great length. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a, uh, uh, it's, it's amazing. Uh, the, the guy was tortured, just tortured in pain. And, and we can't even really imagine the depth of it, but, the deal is, and it's well known in the psychiatric world. Uh, it, it, it's it's called the they call it the electric hat man. So these voices will command you to do something, and if you fail to do it, they give you a headache that is so severe you can end up crawling on the floor, wetting your pants, unable to think of anything else but this white hot cruelty pain is what Jim called it. So the voices start like commanding you, you know, don't eat that, don't take that gig, don't do this, don't do that. And the only really effective weapons Jim had against the voices were drugs and alcohol. And it got worse and worse and worse. By 1975, the voices were just prevalent in his life. By 1978, he's through with professional music. There's an episode where the voices make him turn down a Dylan tour and he goes to Vegas to play with Paul Anka and he sets up at, at the sound check and plays one note and the voices tell him he's dead if he plays the second one. He looks at the musical director and says, I have psychological problems. I can't do this gig. And he went home and he was through. No more sessions, no more nothing. Uh, this, this was the in and out of mental hospitals, drug treatment programs. Uh, and finally, the voices start in on his gold records. The only thing left is he's got his gold records really neatly hung in a study in his, in his two-bedroom uh, condo in North Hollywood. Uh, and the voices want him to throw them away. And, uh, you know, he struggles with that. They fight back. All right, he gives in, he takes the gold records off the wall, out to the dumpster, goes back to his condo and guzzles vodka until he's so drunk that the voices have died down. And then he goes and gets his gold records and hangs them back up. This goes on every night, sometimes many times in a night. And then... The voices started on the drums. They wanted him to throw away the drums. Now, the drums, boy, that one he didn't want to give in on. But they tortured him. And again, he starts taking the drums out to the dumpster. So every night he's taking his gold records out to the dumpster, his drums out to the dumpster, going back to his condo and getting as drunk as he can, and then bringing the drums in and the gold records in. This goes on Every night, it seems for kind of unimaginable, uh, and actually until the night sad, before he kills his mother, horrendous. it seems unimaginable that, that that somebody hadn't kind of taken charge of him really, and that he was just allowed to rattle on like this on his own. So, uh, schizophrenics are not good at relationships of any sort, and Jim had retreated from all relationships. I mean, I'm talking to people that were on hundreds of sessions with him. And I say, you know, what, did you ever have dinner with him? No. Did you know he was married? No. Did you know he had a daughter? No. Did you ever talk to him about anything besides the music in front of you? Can't remember it. Mm. So Jim retreated into a very solitary existence. And at the period of time we're talking about, the end of, the, uh, of, of uh, his um career you know that when he's playing with the blue monkeys and, and taking the gold records down i don't think he was answering his phone i don't think he was seeing anybody uh I, I think he just stayed in his condo and maybe went out to chadney's to have a drink every so often uh he, he was getting food delivered maybe he'd go to the liquor store that he was not in good shape he was overweight uh he was mentally ill 
and and severely so. Mm-hmm. And as you say, the the terrible climax of this is that he 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 killed his mother, and um, and obviously as a result of that, he spent the rest of his life in a secure facility. Is that is that the case? Half his life, thirty, yeah, 30 years, 30, wasn't it? Yeah, 30, 39 years. Thirty nine um, years, yeah, and there was no option of parole at any stage. I don't think Jim wanted out. Every time he came up from parole. Uh, he would stop uh, taking his meds or stop doing his talk therapy or, you know, cause some issue that would uh, make them turn down parole. Uh, he was only sentenced to 16 years. He did 38. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, you know, that's, that's kind of a volunteer thing. I mean, if you're sentenced to 16 uh, years, you can get out pretty soon, soon after that. Yeah, yeah. So he died when? Two years ago or something like that? I died in March of uh, 2023. I right. just finished oh, right. the book. Right, right. So you're you're already embarked on it when he was still alive at that point. Yeah, he wouldn't answer any of my letters. So you know, as like I say, uh, schizophrenics tend to be withdrawn. Uh, so he wasn't really interested in participating. I I don't know uh, what his attitude was uh, when he was talking to. Uh, the gals uh, in 88, 89, you know, it, it's hard to say because the interview transcripts, I mean, he's doped up on uh, on tranquilizers and antipsychotics. He's got like issues. So that's, it's, it's, it's a little bit like a radio station that comes in and goes out and comes in again. Uh, but, you know, he seems to like prison. He, he, he definitely likes the food. Uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, uh, it's it's a uh, it's hard to feel uh, anything but sympathy for this guy. If you read these interview transcripts, he, 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 his, his life just washed up on the on on the rocks, and 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 there's nothing he cares to do about it. Right, right. Well, it's an extraordinary story, and as, as I said earlier, Mark and I have been waiting for somebody to write it we for have. ages. It's and terrific. So we're, book. We're, Very we're, sad. The last two thirds, that. last third, rather. Quite hard to read some of it. I mean, it's yeah. just. But it's... Uh, you're so right, Mark. You know, uh, when I had to go approach revisers, you know, uh, I'd get to that second half of the book and, and my stomach acid would start to come out. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and I've written this thing, but yeah. it's just, there's just so much pain and agony in that second half and of course as a reader you know what the inevitable outcome of this is it is that's true but then again it's balanced by the fantastic success and the amazing insights that you have uh, in the first half and and is and, and the things he achieved in his life which are absolutely incredible it's a very very good book 